So welcome to the, I'll just do a brief intro. Um, so, so welcome to the uh, multi-species coronavirus reading group, Alice. You've offered us um, a, a number of, of really important papers. Um, the, the one, the main one that we've asked everyone to read is, is your new paper with um, Eddie Holmes and, and many others uh, about the new uh, bat coronaviruses and the evolutionary origins of SARS-CoV-2. You've also offered us a number of papers to get us thinking more broadly about uh, bat conservation biology and some new cool techniques you have for um, picking up bats using um, acoustic uh, sonic methods. And you know, I've got a lot of questions about the the new um, SARS coronaviruses, the beta coronaviruses, and you also have some alpha coronaviruses in this paper. Um, some of these questions might be too nerdy, and they're maybe better for Eddie Holmes. But I, I thought I'd sort of start off with kind of a softball question, and just ask you to talk about your your expertise that you brought to this paper, and to to give us just a, a basic background of the natural history of of the horseshoe bats that that you sampled in this particular paper. What what are these guys doing out in the forest? I understand they eat insects and spiders, and um, you know help help us understand the, what what a day in the life of a horseshoe bat looks like. Well, it's probably a good idea to start off not just thinking about the horseshoe bats, but thinking about them in the context of what bats are. So a lot of people are now talking about bats, but they seem to lump them all together as if all bats are very similar. Now, the reality is that bats are deeply divergent. In fact, the most ancient divergence between the two major bat clades is similar to when humans and tarsiers diverged from each other. So we're talking about very, very ancient splits. And that means when we read a lot of the papers that are coming out now that tend to generalize general bat behaviors, every time you read those, you should think about them as, okay, so we should think about this, like someone wrote a paper on Atasia and then they use what they found to ascribe what humans are doing. It's very easy to lump bats together because they all fly, but they're not all the same. And there are both species specific and family specific adaptations that are uniquely different groups. So with the Ranolophal bats, if you've looked at them up close, they are very unique uh, physiologically. They have crazy nose leaves, which are actually involved with shaping their echolocation to the environment that they're in. And they have wings that are generally specially adapted depending on how cluttered their environment is. So most Ranolophal bats are dependent on very dense forests. If you release them in the middle of an open area, because of their echolocation call, it will attenuate very fast meaning that they are effectively blind. They attenuate their core basically disappears. It will disappear before it can hit anything and reflect back to them. So these are species that are adapted to live in these very dense habitats and adapted to the types of food that they would find in those habitats. Within Shishong Bana and within the Institute itself, we've got about 43 bat species. Rhinolophids are actually one of the most diverse. And I have a student which is um, who is looking at cryptic diversity in the Ranolophids. One of the major issues we have in actually a lot of mammal classification is as humans, we tend to use a fairly narrow set of traits to identify species. The problem is that most of those traits rely on clear visual differences. And for an animal that's out at night, those might not be that relevant. What we're finding in the case of the horseshoe bats when we look at these cryptic traits actually particular measurements around the nose leaf and the ears are the most diagnostic features for identifying them. And within the rhinolophids, we've only identified about 50% of the species in Southeast Asia. Again, this is critically important to understand when we're thinking about the potential for spillover, because if you don't know how many species are in an area or what their distribution is, you can't understand a whole lot more about them. So we're looking at a number of different types of diversity, behavior, et cetera, within this region because the rhinolophids are so diverse. And actually even having that baseline information about where these different species are is something that we still are getting to grips with before we can understand anything deeper. Another important point is, so for those of you in Europe, there's actually only about two species of horseshoe bat. I mean, the British Isles has 17 species of bat. My institute has about 42 species, just to put that in perspective. Um, so this is definitely a more interesting place to study bats. 
But if we're thinking about the potential for spillover between different species, obviously when you have these really interesting dynamics of a lot of different species together, particularly a lot of different horseshoe bats, which are of course phylogenetically very similar to each other, there is the potential for spillover from mutation, et cetera. That gets a step more complicated when you have these rhinolophid bats, which are unlikely to leave the forest much, except potentially to go through rubber plantations, but they will share caves with bats that will roost in houses or migrate thousands of kilometers. And again, this is something we're only just starting to understand. Another issue in bats is the majority of species are either too small or have not had good radio tracking data. So we know from doing annual monitoring that a number of non rhinolophid species are likely to be migratory. That means that if they do contract any kind of zoonotic disease from a bat in that cave, they then have the potential to spread it because they're moving over a huge distance. And for the species like uh, Hippocidrus armiger, which is one of the big Hippocidrids in the area, it will co-occupy areas with humans. And so thinking about those different interfaces is really important too. A nice long answer for you. So slowing down on one thing you said there right at the end. So, so uh, horseshoe bats don't generally not hang out in, in houses, but the majority, there are some species. Some species will. So for example, lo a long, long time ago when I was an undergraduate student, my undergraduate thesis was actually on greater horseshoe bats in the UK. And that was based on one of the most monitored colonies they are, which is in an old mansion and they live in the attic. But that mansion is a country house in the UK surrounded by woodland. So those species can still basically uh, commute along the forest to get to that um, roost site. Most of them will not then fly over a rice field, for example, because they just can't get enough information on their surroundings to be able to move through that environment. Super interesting. I, I also love, and, and so for people who are um, just joining the group for the first time today, if, if you have any questions, feel free to just unmute yourself, type them in the chat or, or, or raise your hand and, and um, I'll, I'll call on you. But um, I've, I've got a million follow-up questions. Um, and one of the things I, I really love about this paper is, is its humility. I mean, you're, you're talking about, uh, well, first of all, I'm totally jealous that you get to do field work during the pandemic. Like, it's, well, that's fine. <laughs> for the most part, not possible with, with my university right now. Um, but, you know, you're, you're talking about this one relatively tiny patch of forest when you're thinking about Asia and Southeast that, yeah. Asia. And even within that, that your backyard, <laughs> um, you're finding this mind boggling complexity. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe if you could say more, and, you know, here's a paper you've basically found something that's more genetically similar than, you know, we've all been hearing about RITG 13 for yep. Eon now. And, you know, this paper points out that's still an important part of the story, at least for the spike protein. But, but here you've got RMYN201, if I'm saying that one right. Yeah, um, that's the, Rhinolophus malayanus, and then there's Rhinolophus pusillus RP. Yeah, so it's really important to understand that just in this tiny area, we have this huge diversity of coronaviruses. And I think one of the things this underscores are coronaviruses in bats are not rare, but spillover events are rare. So the next important question is why and under what conditions do spillover events occur? Now, I've worked in Southeast Asia for a long time. Um, my PhD work was based in Thailand, so I know what things are like in this region. Bats are commonly eaten. Um, I would say around a third of the caves in South China and surrounding areas have regular hunting, and some of that did continue through parts of the pandemic. In fact, in Thailand, when I said I worked on bats, people would typically tell me about Kankau Megai, the flying chicken bat, which is a large fruit bat that people have eaten to extinction basically in most areas. Now it only survives around temples where they get protected by the monks. Um, bats are very commonly eaten here. However, we have seen very few known spillover events. Now there's a couple of reasons behind that. One of them of course is that people have acquired immunity if they've been eating it for a long time. Again, that's important because if you then have people visiting the area who are naive, they may be more vulnerable, but 
there are also conditions in the environment which may increase the probability of spillover. That includes the loss of cave sites. It includes disturbing the habitat so that the species have to move over a much wider area. Of course, if they're being exposed to pesticides, there may be impacts on their immune system, which means that they have a lower immunological response. And so they have a higher viral load as well as an increased chance of spillover. So there are all these important demographic questions. And I think this is the direction we need to move into. Now, bats are a unique group. We know that their health span is typically about 10 times that of other mammals. So a seven gram bat can live 41 years, a seven gram rodent will live three years. Um, contrast it to another vertebrate group that has a high metabolic rate, the birds, a bird of that weight can live about 15 years. So they're still doing incredibly well. That means that normal types of stress responses like cortisol indicating stress do not seem to apply in bats. However, how they do respond to ecophysiological stress is something we still don't know a huge amount about. And yet these species are being subjected to environmental pressures. So given that bats have the largest offspring, about 25% of their mother's weight at birth, and the longest pregnancy for any mammal, what is happening to the immune system during that time? How are things like viral load changing during that time? These are questions we still don't have a good answer to. And the next question on top of that is the fact that given that we have a very high rate of mining in Southeast Asia, there's about a 5.7% loss of casts every year, that means you are losing cave sites. Now within bats, especially the rhinolophids, they will typically segregate by sex during the breeding season. So the females will form a maternity roost. If you've lost your maternity roost and now you have a suboptimal roost, which has a new combination of species that would not roost together during the breeding period. You have species that are highly stressed immunologically, they're under a huge amount of pressure, and you have novel interrelationships and novel associations between species. And we do not know what impact that is going to have on the probability of spillover. So these are things that we need to have a better understanding of. Because as we look across Southeast Asia, Things like deforestation and mining rates are continuing to increase. And as we do this and we perturb these systems, we are going to increase the probability of future spillover events. And it is no longer a surprise that there is high levels of coronaviruses in these bats. But unless we understand what causes spillover and we can manage against that, we will see further spillovers. Super interesting. Um, Maybe it's, here's here's getting into some of the like super nerdy viral questions that might be better for for you know Eddie Eddie Holmes and, and that crew. Um, so uh, part of what is uh, closer to SARS-CoV-2 um, in this particular um, coronavirus RPYN06 is um, relating to the RDRP, so the the part of the the virus that actually um, makes more of itself. The, the I, I guess this is the replication. Is, yeah. Yes, yeah, it's the replication, and and it's also the ORF one AB. So um, you, this paper shows like can, viral kinship amongst you know SARS-CoV-2 and kind of the the backbone of like the important um, stuff inside of the coronavirus that makes it tick. And um, you know we've got this other lineage that has a spike, a spike protein. So um, you know, knowing what you know about the complicated ecological dynamics and also the the challenges that bats face in the the dynamically remade anthropogenic landscape, you know what 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 can we say as as we're looking at these these cladograms, as we're you know kind of looking at evidence of, of hor horizontal transfer of, of genes amongst these different strains? It's a really complicated picture. Um, it's a very complicated picture, and we still only have fragments of the picture. Um, I know that there has been recent analysis showing that the the viruses that have been uh, isolated from Nira to Mojang do seem to show a, a relationship in terms of similarity with the originally found COVID viruses. Um, I think the vital missing parts of the question are not just how this variation looks like across the landscape, 
but how that variation looks like depending on the perturbation of the landscape. So where you have these more perturbed systems, et cetera, are we seeing a higher viral load? Are we seeing a higher diversity because we have these higher um, communities and this, um, this aggregation of species that would not normally be together? In terms of evolution and selection, the more we get together these unusual communities, the greater the potential there is for mutation for spread, for slight shifts in the structure if it is moving between similar but different hosts, so different rhinolophid species. And we do have a lot of species that are roosting in the same environments. So for example, we probably have around 12 rhinolophid species within this area here, if not more. So there's a large number of very similar species. That means if it is moving between them, you will obviously have the potential for slight mutations. If you have a higher diversity and you have changes in that community, you also have the ability for those mutations to accrue. Something that's particularly interesting about um, this coronavirus is it does have um, a proofreading mechanism, which is why we initially saw relatively few variants because they'd basically be filtered out. But obviously these variations do occur and that is going to be enhanced by this very dynamic landscape where you have a lot of species that are uh, cohabiting together. So, so earlier in, in the reading group, we um, uh, spent some time with Gary Crameri, who, who told us about um, sort of bat immunology and, and metabolism and um, gave us some, some of the background to help us understand why, um, you know, there's, there's more diversity of, of bat coronaviruses. But, it, you know, speaking of, of these bats that are in your backyard, um, you know, what, what might you tell us about, um, you know, the presence of these viruses in the population. Does, does this necessarily mean that they're sick or are these symbionts? Are these having neutral impacts so, on, on individual animals or do we not even know yet? So bats are amazing. Um, one of the best groups looking at bat immunology is Wang Linfa's group at Duke NUS. And I've talked a lot with Aaron Irving, who's also worked in that group and now has a group of his own. Based on their studies, at least in the species that have been looked at, even on an immunological level, there is often no response to a virus, or if there is, it decreases very fast. So basically, bats tend to seem to ignore viruses that are in their cells normally, but they don't replicate at a high rate. It's almost what could be described, uh, described as an evolutionary cold war. If we look at the genetics of rhinolophids, there is considerable evidence for coevolution between rhinolophids and coronaviruses. You can see the signatures in their DNA. So this has obviously been an evolutionary arms race, but where we are now, they seem to almost be at an impasse where bats will almost never show any symptoms of being infected, but they are able to pass it on and carry the virus. So a little bit like an asymptomatic carrier that doesn't become pre-symptomatic, but is able to then carry that virus for a sustained period. What we don't know is how long and what is going to cause that to be upregulated or downregulated. And again, this is one of the key questions we need to answer next. What's also interesting is if we look within a population, different individuals will have different viruses. So they are not necessarily passing it on to bats at a high rate. So when does that occur? I think there is some evidence that it can cross the placenta even within bats, but it doesn't seem to transfer much within a colony. And all of these questions about within colony transmission are critically important, especially as I said, they rarely show any immunological symptoms, even at a cellular level. Joyce, do you want to go ahead and ask your question about uh, stress in, in bats and other mammals? Hi. Um, so um, I also typed in a comment. Uh, I was quite curious when you say how bats lock um, they have a longevity different to other mammals and how different uh, that means their uh, stress works. Um, can I like know more about that, please? Thanks. So bats are amazing animals. Basically, their me basal metabolism can accelerate to about 16 times the basal rate. So we humans are weaklings. If our temperature fluctuates more than five degrees either way, we fry ourselves and we die. Now, 
flying generates a massive amount of heat. So if we generated that amount of heat, we would literally fry ourselves. It would de destroy cellular processes. So in order to be able to survive those huge energy demands and the rapid shifts in metabolism and heat, bats have had to adapt a suite of mechanisms that basically make them not react in the same way to most things that would cause cellular level degradation. That includes heat shock proteins. That includes things like uh, tumor suppressor cells. It means that things like um, DNA repair is much uh, is accelerated and damage is much fewer. So if you look at things like the level of DNA damage across the lifetime, sometimes it will increase, but if you look at the same bat later on, it will have actually been repaired again. So they have much better mechanisms in place in order to repair that um, genetic tissue. And that means when they replicate those cells, of course, for repair, they are not going to carry on those mutations into their tissue. In addition, the cells that we, well, the genes that we typically upregulate through our lives are the exact opposite to those that bats do. So I can send around some other really good papers on these topics, but as bats age, they basically activate a suite of different genes that counteract the effect of aging in other mammals. That means even if you look at things like the telomeres, so our telomeres get shorter as we get older, that doesn't typically happen in bats. If we encounter an infection, we will have an inflammatory response but the inflammasome response has basically been stopped in bats. So all of the things we do as we get older or we get an infection, bats will do the opposite or ignore it. And as a consequence of that and not reacting to things like oxygen radicals in the same way, they do not show aging. In addition, if you are flying, which is high energy and high stress, think about our athletes. We just had the Olympics many of the top athletes are in their teens because it's basically downhill from there. Um, we're reproductively fittest until our 20s. After that, everything starts falling apart. Now, bats are still reproducing at older ages than humans typically do. You can't do that if everything is starting to degrade. You can't fly if you no longer have elasticity in your tissues. And so they upregulate things like collagen production, so they stay elastic. And so everything in the bat is adapted to staying fit and healthy because their lifestyle is not one that can tolerate actually degrading in the way that most animals do as they get older. And as a consequence of that, they've also evolved a suite of mechanisms that stop them being um, susceptible to viruses and bacteria. Interestingly, they don't show the same response to fungi. And that is why things like white nose syndrome initially, white nose syndrome is a fungal pathogen that's called, caused the death of over 7 million bats in the US. It came from Europe. The bats in Europe are immune. Uh, within the US it initially caused that huge death rate because it causes them to wake up when they're hibernating. So they lose a lot of energy. At the end of hibernation, they're a very low weight. So when it comes to the next hibernation, they can't survive. Bats are not well adapted to fungal pathogens, but they are very well adapted to pathogens that are basically within the cells because they've co-evolved with those kinds of pathogens. Thank you. And That's in terms of definitely. stress, given that I haven't mentioned that much on that, basically when we get stressed, we stop investing in our immune system. That's why often when we start getting really stressed, we get sick, we're immunosuppressed. That doesn't seem to happen in bats. Also, if you want to check if a human is really stressed, we check our cortisol levels, but that's not a good indicator in bats. So obviously their stress pathways are obviously different, but we still don't know exactly how. There have been some studies starting to look at it, but most of them have been in fruit bats because they are easier to rear in captivity. Looking at it in other species is still something we need to do. And again, this is where we need to have com comparators with the primates. We know that uh, macaques are a common model species for us, but they don't always work. At the moment, the closest model we have within the bats are things like Eonycterospelia and Teropus electo. They're both teropid species, but all bats are different. And so we still don't have good bat models for a lot of these other kinds of viruses to understand what these pathways look like but we know that they could be radically different because even things like that longevity period are very different within different species and different families of bats. Thanks so much. 
Um, looking at the latter half of, of the analysis of, of the viral genomes in the paper, you described 17 novel bat alpha coronaviruses. The, the beta coronaviruses are the ones that are related to, to the SARS-CoV lineages. I was just wondering if, if I, I maybe wasn't reading closely enough, but I was wondering if you looked at um, evidence of recombination between the alpha coronavirus genomes, some, some which are related to, you know, um, the vets in the audience might recognize some of these viruses, swine, acute diarrhea syndrome, SADS, COVID. I was in Hepatidurus, yeah. So yeah, again, I... I I'm not sure if Wei Fung and Eddie did in the end. We discussed some other analyses, including trying to do more of the um, seasonal analysis to see how some of these things were varying across the year. Um, it, it's interesting that the acute diarrhea, diarrhea virus was in uh, Hippocidurus. We hadn't sampled many Hippocidurids, and that is a species that will occasionally roost in farm areas. So it, it could be a vector for those viruses. Um, again, understanding the landscape dynamics of these is going to be critically important. And in addition, something we're trying to look at is migration and that kind of thing within these species, because it could be spreading across the landscape. Um, Melanie, do you want to yeah, go yeah. ahead and ask your question, Melanie? Okay, yeah, it's a bit in a different direction now, so I typed it because I'm, uh, I have a crying baby in the background. Um, yeah, but I'm, I'm, my research is on botanical garden, and I spent quite a bit of time with colleagues in South Africa and a colleague in Mexico, like last year, this year, just talking about what the pandemic means for botanical gardens and how it gives them, you know, I mean, another moment to just rethink the, 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 I guess like their role, but. I mean, in South Africa, we're talking about botanical gardens that come out of a colonial tradition. Um, so that might be very different to the bot botanical garden you based at. So I just, because I, I saw in the email you're based at a botanical garden. So I'm just, would be very curious to hear a bit more about how your research relates to the institution. Like how come that, you know, the botanical garden has become a home to such cutting edge research. And, also, like, does the, does the, you know, what is your take on what, what is the role of botanical gardens in all of this? Um, I mean, a lot of botanical gardens focus on in situ conservation. Um, mm -hmm. Well, they focus on plants, but they take plants out of the environment almost. Um, education, but I mean, yeah. And how do you, how do you connect the sites where you work, the, these caves that, that, um, that need to be protected? How do you connect that to the botanical garden? So great questions. Are you uh, in the Cape Town Botanic Garden? Yeah, my research, well, my PhD was about Kirsten Bosch, uh, National Botanical Garden there, yeah. Okay, yeah, I've you been might, to- You might know. <laughs> I've been there once, yeah. Okay. Um, so great questions, and that's an absolutely stunning garden. Um, so I am by training a zoologist and an ecologist. The institute here actually came together by combining an ecological institute that was based in Kunming with the botanic garden. So not all the groups look on plants and I'm not a plant person. Um, basically, I have been working in the Southeast Asian region for a long time, about 14 years. And this seemed like an interesting place to be looking at basically uh, frontier conservation zoological research, which most of Southeast Asia doesn't have the capacity to do. And yet this is a global hotspot for biodiversity. So it's critically important to do. When I worked in Thailand, things have changed a huge amount since I was there. I worked in the South of Thailand in Hat Yai. Um, working as a foreigner, trying to secure the funds and access resources was often challenging, which is why I continue to collaborate with them, but I don't myself live there now. Um, Within a botanic garden, I think one thing we need to do is there's two main elements. One is communicating the fact that you don't need to be scared of biodiversity, but you do need to respect that. So watching things like the media portrayal of bats through the pandemic has been interesting because, of course, it's very easy to demonize a group. But normally when we see something like a virus spilling over, it's because humans have mismanaged the environment. Um, and things are out of balance. A really good example of how that can happen would be with something like Hendra. So in Australia, lots of people would hand rear bats because during cyclones and things, you'd have bats being orphaned. 
there were never incidences of Hendra passing from bats to humans. But then bats started roosting in fruiting trees within um, basically horse enclosures, and the horses got Hendra from the bats, and then they passed it on to the humans. So as we modify the environment, we cause a domino effect that can cause viral spillover. And it's very important for people to remember that the bats aren't the problem. The people mismanaging the environment and unsustainably using resources is the problem. And so we still have a duty to safeguard biodiversity. The second part is not only does that provide crucial services, I mean, uh, insectivorous bats contribute billions of dollars in terms of pest control. Fruit bats are crucial as pollinators and seed dispersers, but the one health is also critical. And I think something like a botanic garden can actually educate people that we are part of the system. We rely on resources that come from the system, but that means we also need to safeguard them. If we act unsustainably, this is the kind of consequences we get. But in addition, the fruits, et cetera, that we enjoy eating that make our lives better are a product of biodiversity. And if we mismanage the system, we will not have access to those resources either. So I think that, those are lessons that botanic garden can communicate, especially as, I mean, in the tropics, whether you're in South Africa or South China, there are trees and there are plants here that are bat pollinated. And I think highlighting that we do access these resources, even for things like banana. I mean, the banana almost went extinct from the human diet once because of a virus. The reason that we still have bananas is in part because wild type bananas are pollinated and that means we've got genetic diversity to go back to so that we can keep developing new varieties and we can maintain that in our diet. And they are principally pollinated by things like that. Within the garden, the cave is in the garden, but it's not accessible to most people. Um, within the whole of Southeast Asia, caves are huge tourist sites. Um, when we did work in Myanmar, Typically, a marker of how rich an area was, was has it turned any cave it can find into a Buddhist tourist site? Um, this isn't great for the bats, especially when the first thing they do is knock down the stalactites and put cement on the floor. But finding better ways to manage the environment so people can enjoy biodiversity without damaging it is critically important because we need to learn to be better stewards and better neighbors. And the best way we can do that is by educating people so that they care about it and empowering them so they know how to act and can develop best practice. As long as we think of biodiversity as an extra, we are not going to mainstream it into policy and practice. But once we start realizing how reliant we are on it, you can actually empower consumers to be better and uh, promote more sustainable practices. And yep, Durians are pollinated by bats. Agave for tequila is pollinated by bats. A baobab, which is a keystone in Africa, pollinated by bats. Sanguaro cactuses, eucalyptuses, all of these keystone trees are principally pollinated by bats. People don't realize it, but they are critical to these landscapes. And if people realize that they are crucial elements of the landscape, we need to think about how to manage these landscapes sustainably. You can't just cut out part of it without it having a slew of other consequences. Aria, do you wanna ask your question? Um, I think Alice kind of covered it a little bit already as well with the pollinations. But um, yeah, listening to Melanie asking about botanical gardens, my context and my background is like, a person who grew up in the city and I, I see bats in the city and yeah. I don't really know what they are when I was a kid. It was just something that fly really fast until so people were saying like they eat mosquitoes and I'm like, why don't we have more bats for mosquitoes? Um, but when I moved to the Northeast of Thailand and tried to find out more about bats, um, they're insect bats, but most of the mm -hmm. The knowledge about bats in Thailand and in the South, as you already have a lot of experience that, and they are like cave bats. So in order to find out about insect bats here, it's really different and it's really difficult as well. And also because the Northeast, it's, um, it's more like a wetland. So we have a lot of hydropower projects as well, and which flood the forest. So- And the caves, yeah. Yeah, in the cave. So a lot of when we ask like farmers or um, people here, they would think of 
bats with temples because they don't have any more trees to hang out or so people would see bats at the temples or um, on the dam gate and that's why they go hunt and eat as well and so I guess these kind of contexts I'm trying to um, think of how can we work out with the landscape as well as like we see bats in the city more or we see bats in the infrastructures more I mean compared to Shishong Banna and um, botanical gardens. So. so it's a really nice comment. Um, I think one of the many great things about bats is they're one of the most diverse groups that people will probably see in cities of mammals. If they go out at night, you can find them. Most of the time we are not aware that they're there, even though they're delivering services. In Thailand, there's a lot more knowledge in the South because one of the main bat groups is at Prince of Songkhla University. Um, there are, is also some bat groups that have now established at places like Kassasa, and I think there may be one at Chula. Um, there aren't good bat groups in the North, so there isn't good data available. But as you say, it's critically important. Southeast Asia actually has one of the highest rates of um, damming in the world, and that means forests and caves are being flooded, especially as karst areas are often selected for dam sites because you already have high cliffs. So I've done some work at Khao Sop, which is also surrounded by limestone casts, and a lot of those caves have been flooded. Something that people are less aware of that's also important, though, is if you talk to people that have lived in areas for a long time and visited caves as children, they will often tell you that things like how wet the cave is has changed. That's because as we've changed agriculture around these areas, we have caused a change in things like the water table, the pesticide levels, and that is also impacting on the caves. We don't have good data on how much or what impact it's having. And we need a huge amount more data on that. Um, in places like Thailand, yeah, the easiest way to find bats, go to a temple. So many of the caves in Thailand are within kept temple sites. And I mean, Back when I was a PhD student, we would often stay in the monastery and survey the cave. It was the easiest way of doing survey work. Um, some monks are better stewards than others. So in the best run caves, you'll have one chamber that is full of your Buddha statues and they have light. And then you will have the dark part of the cave that humans don't really go into. And that's where you'll find a lot more species. In that site that is full of people and incense and lights, there might be a couple of species, but most species don't tolerate that degree of disturbance. So also developing the best practice for these sites. Something that Flora and Fauna International have done have developed uh, best practice guidelines for lighting inside caves. So for example, rather than having it on all the time, have it activated when humans go by. Have it so it is a particular frequency that will cause less disturbance. So you can still educate people and use these spaces but you reduce the interface and the negative implications. Because animals are trying to breed in these conditions, it's also really stressful if it's noisy and people will shine lights at them. So it's also another possible avenue for spillover. So all of these things work together and we need to better manage these landscapes so we can enjoy the benefits, but also reduce the risks both to those native populations and in terms of spillover potential. Thanks. Um, Cesar, uh, go ahead with your uh, question. Um, I thank you so much. Uh, I was thinking of well, virus as, as a trace of, of an ecological relation, so, mm -hmm. or of a relation in general. And then I was wondering about the pangolins and bats. And also in the paper, you were mentioning that, or that there was a, a relation between an area the, the viruses, the, the bats of an area and the pangolins of another area, if I understood correctly. But I didn't understand what was the, yeah. I, I don't understand the, the geography so well. So the viruses are very similar. Um, what we don't know at the moment is we know that bats have very similar coronaviruses that are the ancestors to COVID. We don't know how it got from the bats to the humans. The pangolin viruses are very, very similar, but we don't know yet if they were the intermediate host. There is also a very strong possibility that it could have been something like a civet, um, 
or one of the badges, because these will also co-occupy environments. What is likely to have happened is either the virus started in bats and went to humans. What is more likely is the virus started in bats, then it went to an intermediate host, which may have been a pangolin, but their populations are really low. Um, and that could have happened anywhere in Asia, or it went to another intermediate host, which may have been a small carnivore. Now, domestic cats can carry very similar viruses. Civets, raccoon dogs also do. These are also animals that will co-occupy the same spaces that bats will use. They will, they will go into caves, for example. They will sleep in caves. When we have done surveys, I have found, uh, actually, here is a, a porcupine quill that I found inside a cave, deep inside a cave. So there are other animals that are utilizing these spaces. Now, porcupines are popular to eat in some areas um, and their quills are certainly popular. It is very possible that animals that were sharing the same spaces of bats were then either eaten or used for fur, for example. Another tricky thing is a lot of Southeast Asia has a lot of fur farm production. One issue is that many of the animals that are farmed are also native to Southeast Asia, meaning that not all of the animals that are in captivity started in captivity. Now, if you have a civet that has been sleeping in a cave, sharing that space with bats that is then brought into a captive population, very poor biosafety conditions, urination, et cetera, blah, 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 there is a very high potential for that to spread to other individuals in the same conditions. Those animals are also in immediate proximity to humans. So there are these other interfaces. And one really big issue within Asia is the farming of wildlife because it provides that conduit from areas which are occupied by bats, et cetera, and humans. And there is very little management of that kind of system at present. Kind of related with that, if I can. Uh, Go for it. Um, well, I, I have seen some papers about, about rhinolophus in traditional medicine, and I was wondering how specific that is, um, because it wasn't a very good paper. Um, so I was like, okay, is the, is, are they talking about a specific species, how widely distributed that is? Uh, so have you found more things about traditional medicine uses of bats? So bat feces are actually common in traditional medicine. Uh, it has a special name and it's used for things like treating child with malnutrition. I mean, if they're sick, obviously bat guano will really help with that. Um, there are some bats used in traditional medicine, not just in China, but in places like Indonesia. Bats are commonly used to treat conditions like asthma, um, I think, because they're thought to be flying through the air and therefore it's to do with breathing. Um, of course, the efficacy, they're another mammal. There are very unlikely to be active compounds that are going to do anything from them, but they are used in traditional medicine across a lot of Asia. However, given that in that context, they are often dried, so any chances of a virus are going to be reduced, I think it's much more likely that direct consumption would be responsible because they are widely consumed across Asia and across Pacific islands. They were often one of the main forms of mammalian protein in a lot of Pacific islands, to the extent that in places like Malaku, bat teeth are used as currency. So bat, humans eat a lot of bats and they don't just have to be dried out to do it. They can be barbecued, they can be in soup. They are a common food source. Spillover, still very rare, unless perhaps you are that tourist who has never had exposure before. Thank you, John. Oh, uh, Rachel, go ahead. Thanks, Alice. Um, I was just wondering, just given the profound racism and ethnocentrism that continues to uh, be underscored by our pandemic now, I wonder if you could say more about that introductory segment of your paper. Um, I know we've had um, um, our colleague Jakob uh, has come to speak with us um, about his uh, studies, um, who's up in Basel, and, um, you know, uh, Eben, your, uh, one of your early papers uh, from last year, 
uh, addresses this, but I just wonder if you could say a little bit more about this because I just feel like it's a daily occurrence uh, that I'm hearing people um, comment in the EU. Uh, we're hearing things, you know, across the United States. I lived in Thailand myself for many years, and my family and friends there are saying things, you know, we don't like this kind of, uh, you know, uh, commentary and things like that. So I, I wonder if just to kind of go back to your, the introductory segment of your paper and kind of underscore that segment where you write, aside from bats and humans, coronaviruses can infect a wide range of domestic and wild animals, including pigs, cattle, mice, cats, dogs, chickens, deer, and hedgehogs, as well as um, badgers you were just mentioning. Um, so could you just say a little bit more about that? Why is that, I, that to me is a profound sentence um, in given our current moment. And I just wonder if you could draw out a little yeah. bit more for us. So there's a couple of really important points there. One is the fact that the politicization of this issue is directly inhibiting our ability to understand what the issue is. I mean, I'm sitting here in South China. Doing research now is very, very challenging because I'm a foreigner working on bats in China. And the world's perspective on that it has become very polarized. I mean, if you've talked to Eddie Holmes, it's the same. This has become a political question. And that gets in the way of doing the science because we get accused of everything from being a, a Russian spy. And yeah, I, I have had that accusation before now to being a, a, a prop for the, um, the Communist Party. None of these are helpful in order to get to the scientific basis of this. And understanding what the important questions are that will prevent future pandemics is critical now. And yet we have allowed human biases to get in the way of those most critical of questions. Um, we need to scale back judgmentalness. We still do not know how that spillover occurred, but what we do know is there is a huge potential for future spillovers, which could occur anywhere in the world. Unless we focus on the mechanisms behind what those spillovers are, we are not going to learn the lessons we need to. And instead we have gone in another direction, going down a black hole of trying to find bat zero. To me, that's not a useful question. In fact, the initial spillover could have happened many years ago and that colony may not be there anymore. What we do need to understand is how and when spillovers occur. And that does not and should not be a political question. In terms of things like judgmentalness behind eating bats, yes, people do it. But in France, people eat donkeys and the English criticize that. We need to step away from these societal biases and focus on the scientific questions behind this. We don't know if it did come directly from a bat or if there was an intermediate host. And those questions are important, but not as in judging what another country is doing. So the next questions have to be, Okay, how are things like demography, how are things like landscape management impacting the probability of spillover in these species? There are really important lessons from countries like the UK with tuberculosis. Now, I, I grew up on a farm in the UK. My, my father was a farmer and he hated badgers because of TB. And he wanted there to be culls because of the TB, despite the fact that the chief scientists have said that that would exacerbate the problem by making badgers move and therefore spreading it around more and being stressed. These are principles we still have no idea of with the current pandemic because we don't know how stress is impacting on bats. So we need to look at those scientific dynamics and we need to stop trying to chase down where this particular one originated, because it's not gonna help us. Understanding the mechanisms are, and that requires collaboration and moving away from these questions that are only going to cause further polarization. Thanks. And Thanks. maybe to editorialize a little bit and connect the dots. I mean, you know, we don't have bats or pangolins from the, the Wuhan market. You know, we, we have um, a story that's yet to be told. And as, as you said, you know, we might not like tell the story of bat zero and and that's not necessarily that's not the important story to necessarily be telling so so i think it's it's these interdisciplinary conversations where we think where we can think about you know political economy where we can think about um you know haptic dynamics and um you know the religious dynamics you know uh, uh tourist pilgrims but also religious pilgrimages um 
how we, how we can think kind of capitalism alongside uh, these viral tracings that Cesar was talking about uh, alongside, um, you know, the important um, ecological questions we need to remain ever mindful of in a, a planetary ecology that's um, dynamically changing. I, I think these are all important things that we can start to try to do together, um, but it is very difficult with the, the way that these kind of questions have been politicized and um, all kinds of racisms and xenophobias uh, making, making it difficult for us all. Um, I've, I've got a, a final question, it just sort of, maybe, oh wait, Cesar, do you have one? Um, go ahead, Cesar, yeah. It kind of continuing, mm -hmm. um, are, there, are there studies on, on viruses and, and the diet of bats? I'm thinking there was a, a paper so on, yeah. The case you have there on parasitoid wasps and moths is a bit different because those parasitoid moths, uh, wasps actually manipulate the caterpillars of the uh, moths. And uh, I, I learned that lesson as a child with my tank of caterpillars, some of which then exploded with wasp pupae. Uh, I, I did not enjoy that experience with my what was meant to turn into a beautiful bat, uh, butterfly and turned into a host of small wasps. Um, so that's a slightly different situation. With the bats, it doesn't seem that the viruses typically will affect them in the same way. Um, it's a different form of manipulation. The most comparable to the, the uh, example you give there with the parasitoid wasps would be things like the um, cordyceps fungus. So if you look at, and this doesn't affect bats to our knowledge, but if you walk around a rainforest in Thailand, you might find an ant or a moth or something that's mandibles are clamped to a leaf and it will have fungal antlers that have exploded through its head because it's been infected by cordyceps fungus, which basically manipulates its host and its last stage will make them go to the top of something, clamp on and they will die and the uh, fungal spores will go everywhere. There does not seem to be an equivalent. Yeah, there you go, nice graphic image for you. Um, that doesn't seem to be an equivalent with the viruses in bats. Um, an interesting other example would be in the case of there is um, a common uh, virus or bacteria that is in cat and dog feces, and that can infect humans as well as rodents and tends to make them more risk prone. So it's an interesting example that our behavior can be manipulated but it's typically only by certain types of organism because it, they require it as part of their food chain. Um, I need to look up what that is because it's not my area, but it is very interesting to see how manipulable we all are. Thank you. Thanks, Al. So, so we're right at the hour. Um, uh, so first of all, thank you, Alice. This was a delightful encounter. Um, I'm learning more every time we talk and um, hope to have many future conversations. So round of applause. It's and a um, for, for next week, we have uh, Stephen Goldstein. Um, and, and Rachel, do you remember what paper we're discussing of his? I, I think he's, he's a, a, a coronavirus virologist, right? Do you have the paper title at hand? I don't have it in front of me, but uh, no. I was just going to try anyway. to pull it up. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, next week, uh, 4 p.m. Mountain Time, 8 a.m. Melbourne. Uh, that's probably early in China. I'm not sure exactly what time it is, uh, but probably too early in China. <laughs> uh, we'll be having a conversation about uh, SARS coronaviruses again. <laughs> Um, but yeah, this this is this was really great, and I, I love the way that you're able to connect all the dots and um, you know uh, think think across multiple uh, scales and disciplines. So it's 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 been a real delight. It's a pleasure, and if people do have further up questions, then just email me anytime, and I'm happy to talk more. Great. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Good to see you. It's been a pleasure. Bye for now. Bye.